Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Tiny Organisms in the Elkhorn Sloughs Mudflats. We are very excited to have you all here with us. My name is Steve, and I'm your Zoom host for this session, and I'll be taking note of the chat box in both Zoom and in Whova. Just a few reminders, uh, this presentation will be recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, please leave your camera off. Please mute yourself during the presentation. Our question and answer session will follow the presentation. Uh, your mute uh, button is located at the bottom left corner of your Zoom screen if you are on a desktop. If you are on a mobile device, you can tap your screen and find the mute button at the bottom. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box as well, as we will have time for questions at the very end, about seven minutes or so. Your chat box will, uh, can be found at the bottom center of the Zoom screen. Now to our program, Ariel Hunter uh, is the Community Outreach Coordinator at Elkhorn Slough. And without further ado, we will turn the session over to Ariel. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here today. Uh, this is probably of all the things that my job encompasses, looking at microscopic organisms is hands down my favorite thing to do. So I'm really excited to be here with you this morning. Um, definitely feel free to, like Steve said, throw questions into the chat at all times. And I will try to keep myself on it uh, time-wise so that we can share out um, all of your questions or comments at the end. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the Elkhorn Slough's tiniest animals. Um, now the Elkhorn Slough is a winding waterway that's smack dab in the middle of the Monterey Bay. So halfway between Santa Cruz and Monterey. Um, and I work with the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. So this is a reserve that's focused on actively studying and stewarding or taking care of the land that's adjacent to the Elkhorn Slough. Um, and so we have scientists who are going out in the field um, using our lab in here. And we also have stewards, conservationists who are going out and planting native plants and removing invasive ones. Um, and then we have educators like myself who are uh, engaging the public around this. Um, and what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be looking at a few of the really teeny tiny organisms that live in the mudflats. So the area where the tidal water comes in and it covers the land for a little bit of the day and then uncovers it and leaves this baked tidal mudflat. Um, it's usually what smells bad. If you go into a wetland and it smells kind of not so good, that's usually the mud, but all of that bad smell is bacteria and nutrients and things that actually produce lots of food for the tiny creatures that live in that ecosystem. And of course the tiny creatures then attract larger creatures um, that then attract even larger creatures like sea otters, um, which we tend to really like. So though I don't have sea otters to show you today, I do have the things that they inherently rely on. So uh, if there are any like glitches in my camera setup as you're looking at through our microscope, because um, you are actually looking at or will be looking at a live feed of our microscope. So you'll see everything expanded. If there's something that seems off screen, just drop a line in the uh, chat to Steve and he'll let me know to adjust my camera. Um, but without any more ado, I'm going to go ahead and flip my camera around and introduce you to some of these creatures. Now, a lot of these things that we're going to look at today, and we're going to start with some of our animals that are sessile. And I love the word sessile. Um, it's a great one to throw out at parties. No one ever seems to know what it means. It basically means sedentary. Um, so these are the animals that would have done really well during the pandemic. They just want to sit at home, do their own thing. Um, there are a couple of moving creatures in here. So you can see there's some stuff moving around in the background. But we're going to focus on some of the animals, animals that are sedentary. They don't get up and move and they rely on special body parts to be able to move for them. So this first one that we're looking at kind of looks like a plant and it has this kind of branching quality to it. I'll zoom in so you can see it really close up. This is something called a bryozoan and you can see that it's got this nice bright purple color. That's from the pigmentation in its body. 
And towards the ends here, it has what looks almost like little cups or little pods. And each of these little pods has a living creature inside of it. So each one of these is a little individual animal and they are animals. They have a feeding tube that comes out and snatches teeny tiny plankton and pulls it back inside. Though none of them are actively working today. We'll see if we can find some live ones later. But each of these is a clone of the other. So when you zoom out and you see this whole colony, all of these little pods that are kind of stuck together, these are all clones of the same animal and they're all attached with a stomach. So imagine you had a thousand clones all attached to you via stomach. You could eat like a thousand hamburgers all at once. So I love these guys. I think that they're so cool that they have the ability to branch themselves off and create thousands of others. You can see more of them down here. What's interesting is we used to have a lot of bryozoans in our water. Um, and this time last year, we were still seeing tons of them. Right now, we're not seeing as many as we used to, and we're not sure why. So our scientists are actually out working on uh, finding out whether there was a change in the population or if there was just a change in the water, which sometimes happens seasonally. Another one of our sessile or sedentary or couch potato creatures are these. And these creatures, which you can see up here, are called hydroids. And they look a lot like anemones and jellyfish because they actually are very closely related to anemones and jellyfish. Just like, uh, I like to think of them as an anemone that's been stretched out. Um, so you can see there's a base back here and it's been almost like stretched into a really thin skinny tube. And then at the top here, you can see those tentacles that we're used to seeing on anemones. And just like anemones, Hydroids will use those tentacles to capture whatever is around them. Um, they're not big enough to capture something like me. My finger is way bigger than their tentacles, um, but they are big enough to capture teeny tiny plankton and drifting creatures that are floating around in the waters around them. And what's interesting to us is we've seen more of these hydroids this year than we've ever seen before. We usually only get one or two of them every year and they're kind of like a rare thing for us to find or we we up until a month ago they were a rare thing to find now we're seeing tons of them so we're very curious to see if there's just been a shift in the underwater population from those bryozoans dominating the space to these hydroids and you can see they move life as a hydroid moves very very slowly but this one here is very very gently reaching out its tentacles and scoping to see if it can find any food in the nearby area. But again, these attach themselves at the base out here to something, so they rely on finding a rock or a uh, old piece of concrete sticking out of the mud that they can attach to because they can't swim around themselves. They don't have any way to move in the water. And so they have to find something hard that they can attach themselves to to be able to grow. Now, one of the other ones, I'm gonna zoom around this dish a little bit. There's those bryozoans again. This blob is one of my all time favorite organisms on this planet. Because when I see this blob, the first thing I think is this can't be a living organism. It looks like a rock. But on closer inspection, if we zoom in to start looking at some of the finer features on it, you can see that it's kind of porous. It almost looks like maybe there's webbing inside of it. And here at the top, it has a lot of little tiny holes and things buried into it. This is a living organism and it is an animal. So it is not a plant. This is one of the most rudimentary, one of the most original animals. This is a sponge. So sponges are living creatures. They have a hole up at the top up here 
that they're able to suck in water through and that's what they breathe from and it's also what they take in food from and then they have a hole that they spit everything back out of and they grow as almost like webbing their tissue is a lot different from human tissue and uh, just about any other animal tissue in the animal kingdom they have this kind of web-like material that gives them that spongy texture that no other animal has um, that also makes it so that if these sponges get ripped or torn they can actually restitch themselves back together at the end. So it's kind of like um, if you've ever seen the movie, The Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, there's a scene where one of the characters, she loses one of her arms and she's a rag doll. So she just stitches that arm right back on, no problem. We as humans definitely cannot do that. Most animals can't do that, although some things like those hydroids I showed you are able to split into two different animals if they lose a limb. If this sponge loses a part of it, as long as that part stays nearby, it can actually restitch itself back together. Uh, so it's almost like a zombie animal, except that zombieism is just what this animal uses to survive because out in this environment, there are tons of things and we can see one right here. I'm gonna shift so that we can get some light on him. This little creature here that I'll try to highlight, it's hanging out right in the middle of the dish in kind of an odd spot. This creature is the main reason why this sponge has developed that zombie adaptation, that ability to reattach and regrow itself. Um, because creatures like this, which we'll look at more closely in a second, love to burrow into sponges to find homes. Um, and so this is an amphipod. We'll look at them a little more closely in a second. Um, these amphipods dig their way into the sponges to find shelter because if you're out in the mud flat, there's not a lot of cover from predators. But if you can dig yourself into a sponge, you have a nice built-in cover because there's not a lot of animals that eat sponges. Um, so you're kind of safe if you can get in there. So again, the animal finds shelter in another animal, the sponge, and the sponge isn't necessarily hurt because it just regrows itself around the new tunnel that's been created by that animal. The last of our sessile or sedentary creatures that I'm gonna show you is this one. And this one always reminds me of like a giant strawberry. Uh, sim this animal is another type of bryozoan and I'm gonna zoom in here so we can see inner workings of it a little closer. So just like that purple branching stuff that we saw before, this bryozoan has all sorts of different pods on it. And each of these little boxes houses a different bryozoan, a different creature that's living in there that's feeding out of this little tube. But I love that this one, instead of branching out into something that looks like a plant, it grows as a crust. And so it can actually grow larger because if you are growing like a giant plant and you're in the water, a big tide or a heavy wave can pull you out of the water more easily. Whereas if you're growing like a big crust all over everything, you're gonna be able to kind of hold on and stay safe no matter how big you get. So there's a lot of different animals that take advantage of one, becoming clones so that, and you can actually see on the edge of this colony, this is where some of those bryozoans got eaten or they got broken off uh, during a heavy storm like last week. And when that happens, these clones just grow new clones and it kind of strengthen out the colony and fan it out from there, right? So if you have a thousand of you, it's okay if you lose a few. Um, and that's what's happening here in these edges. So we've got our sessile creatures. We also have animals that like to move. And these ones, again, they like to move. So it may be a little bit funky 
to try to capture them. So uh, bear with me as we try to see if we can find them. I'm gonna start with some of the ones that are a little bit easier because they're a little slower. This creature may look very familiar to you if you've ever uh, been out in the forest or really just in your backyard flipping over rocks and you find, um, I always called them roly polies as a kid. Uh, a lot of people call them pill bugs. This, their group is called isopod. And there's tons of species of isopods, including the land dwelling ones called roly polies that you find in your backyard, but most of them live in the ocean. And this isopod here, I'll bring it down into the corner here so you can see its face, has an eye on either side. You can see it just kind of gleaming in the light here. We'll zoom in on that in a second because they have incredible eyes. And it has lots of little armored plates, just like the roly polies again that you find in your backyard. These look very similar. And those plates protect it from anything that might capture it. And they also allow it, because they're interlocking, they allow it to curl up into a little ball to defend itself if it needs to. And these, just like the ones you find in your backyard that roll up into your hand if you pick them up, this does the same thing. So this will roll up into a tiny ball if I tried to pick it up, which I won't do because I don't want to freak it out too much today. These isopods have incredible eyes. And I'm going to see if we can get a good view on this one since it's really cooperating today and not running around like a crazy beast, which they sometimes do. Awesome. Give me a second just to adjust the light there a little bit. So its eye right down here, you can just barely see that there's, it's almost like a golf ball in here. It's got all sorts of little dots or little squares in it, little circles. Um, and those are, if you imagine, they're sort of like pixels in a picture. And I don't know how many people on here have played the original Super Mario games um, from the 80s and 90s, where it was a little pixelated creature. And you could tell that Mario had a hat and he was a little plumber but he was 8-bit. He was really hard to see. He was kind of blurry. Uh, that is the kind of vision that these creatures have. So each of these dots is almost like a pixel and gives them one part of the world that they're seeing. So they don't see very well, um, but they can pick up light and shadow really well because those pixels kind of act like graphing paper. And as a shadow comes over them, they can measure how much of the area of their eye is covered in shadow. And they can run away because they can react to that shadow. And so you noticed it moved a little bit as I was moving around my light here to adjust it because it was reading the light and the shadow and saying, oh, that might be a predator flying above me. I should move or hunker down or curl into a ball here. And what's amazing is flies, like the ones that you have in, uh, that you see around your house sometimes, they have the same eyes, but instead of seeing an 8-bit because they only have a few of these pixels, they have thousands of them. And so they see in like high definition, and that's why flies can react much more quickly than these isopods and pill bugs can because they have much more refined eyesight. They're seeing like modern HD vision, whereas these are not seeing as well. And it makes sense that they don't have really advanced eyes because they're living underwater. And I don't know how many of you have gone swimming and tried to open your eyes underwater and look around, but it's usually pretty hard. You can't see very much anyways. So having eyes underwater is not usually the sense that you're gonna adapt. Now this wiggling creature that looks like a shrimp that's also hanging out on this isopod, this is called an amphipod. And their kind of salient feature that makes them really identifiable is their curved body. On this one, what's cool is you can actually see its stomach inside there. So all of that red. Oh, and there's another one coming in. Amphipods are very territorial. 
Um, they push and shove each other to get into the best spaces. They like to be attached to things. So even though they're free swimming and they can run around, they're not sessile, they're not stuck like some of those other ones we saw. Um, they prefer to be attached to something because it means that they're safe, right? If you are out swimming in the water column, you are easy to spot. But if you're attached to something, you can hide. And so they will push each other around to get into the best hiding spaces. And usually the ones that are a little bit bigger win. What's cool on this one is it has, similar to that isopod down here, it has the same kind of eye that sees in pixelated vision, but you can also see the really well-developed antennas and lots of feet. So their feet help it to swim around, which is what it's trying to do right now. And uh, they also help it to hold on to its eggs. So when the females lay their eggs, they'll actually lay them on the underside of their belly and they can use their legs to flush oxygen over them. And they become like a mobile nest, kind of like those uh, baby backpacks, except instead of holding just one baby, they can hold hundreds of them underneath their belly there. And what I love about this one, I'm gonna see if I can zero in. He might, he or she might run away as soon as I get close enough. But on this one, you can just see some of its organs, its stomach. And its stomach is bright pink. So let's see if this will let me zoom in. They do respond to movement in the water. So you've got to go very, very gently and carefully. Otherwise, you freak out and run away. Oh, no, don't do it. We're not going to hurt you. There you go. So you can see the color, the dark color inside there. That is, and this is an amphipod that has eaten a lot today. And the red is copepods. So I don't have any copepods today. They are too small to be captured with just your hands. You would need a net. But copepods are bright red plankton. And they're red because red is the color that disappears when you go underwater. So if you are all red from head to toe and you go down about 10 feet in the ocean, you disappear. You show up as black. You blend in perfectly. So a lot of plankton and things that live in the, the ocean are red because it's kind of a camouflaged color underwater. Um, even though up here under a light, it does not work as well. And so the bright red in this amphi amphipod tells me that he or she had a nice big lunch today because there must be tons of cocoa pods in there. Now I'm going to look around for a second in my dish here. And for those who are wondering where I got the sample, I literally just walked down to the side of the water. There's an amphipod that looks like it might have eggs. Hopefully we can find that one again in a second. I walked down to the water and just scooped up what I saw hanging out. So I scooped up all the muck that was hanging off the dock and these creatures came along with it. So I took my scoop of muck and I brought it back to our lab here and started pulling the muck apart to find the little things that were living inside of it. This creature here that's kind of bucking around and looks almost like a stick. This is an animal. Ooh, this is a skeleton shrimp. So they're called skeleton shrimp because they look bony and brittle, almost like a skeleton. And they have a face up at the top here so you can see its face and its antennae, just like those amphipods, they have tons of antennae to be able to sense and feel the environment. They also like to use their antennae to grab food. So they actually have little sticky hairs all along these antennae that allow them to snatch plankton drifting by to eat them. So they'll brush the plankton out of the water and eat them. And you can see it just barely doing that as it pulls some of its antennae into its face to eat them. They also have some front legs to be able to grab with. So these almost look like the limbs on a praying mantis. So those can help this skeleton shrimp either push other skeleton shrimp out of the way to claim territory or to try to fend off 
any of the amphipods that are coming in to try to compete for space as well. So they're not big enough that they would really defend it from anything big like a bird or a fish that wanted to eat it, but they can help it move around in its environment and stake out its claim. And down here, I told you that amphipods like to lay their eggs on their belly. I'm gonna see if I can get her into a really nice view. This skeleton shrimp does the same thing. So she lays her eggs on her belly and then she has a little clamp and you can just see it moving gently around to hold them in. And she's moving water over the eggs at all times, making sure that they can breathe nice and easy. Ariel, and in probably a week or so. Oh, yeah, I just saw the time. Um, so uh, in a week or so, these eggs will hatch out into thousands of teeny tiny skeleton shrimps and grow up to look just like her. And she's actually the last of our moving creatures. So I will go ahead and open it up for questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Steve, for the reminder. Absolutely. If anyone does have any questions, you can type them in the chat box and I will read them to Ariel. We have a question from Helen. Do you have any recommendations for microscopes we can purchase to look at organisms like them at home? Ooh, that's a good question. So there's a couple of different places you can get microscopes. Um, online is probably the easiest. The microscopes we have are called dissecting microscopes and you can get tons of different kinds. Um, the specific model that I have is no longer on the market, but if you look up dissecting microscope, that will give you the same magnification as this. Um, and it's a good magnification for just being able to see things a little bit bigger. So all of these creatures are creatures that I can see with my naked eye, but they're really tiny, they're like this big in front of me. And so the dissecting scope gives me a really good view of all of them. Um, if you wanted to see like cells or you wanted to see all the little eggs in here, you would probably have to get a compound microscope, um, which are a little more expensive. But dissecting scopes are what to look up and you can usually find them just on Amazon. Thank you. And Tessa has a question. Have you ever come across any unidentified organisms? You know, we have. Um, so usually they're, they're, we haven't come across in this lab any organisms that we can't ultimately identify. So we come across things where we look at it kind of like this one and go, whoa, wait a second, what is that? That doesn't look like what I usually see when I pull stuff from the mud. Um, I did a little identification on this one and this is actually a baby razor clam. So this guy in real life is about this big. They're teeny, teeny, tiny, but they start their life attached to the mud before they start burrowing in places. Um, we do sometimes find some creatures um, like the hydroids I pointed out earlier that again, we aren't sure what they are. So we have to take them to our research team to find out. So far in this lab, we haven't found any creatures that are entirely new and have not be, been identified. And our last question we have time for comes from David. What kind of animals or organisms feed off of those, of these smaller organisms? Yes. I so um, something like a clam like this is gonna be feeding on plankton. So they're actually gonna be eating some of the other creatures we've been seeing, but especially as they get bigger. So right now this clam is tiny. It's not gonna be able to eat the amphipods we've been seeing, but as this clam gets bigger, this little amphipod will become food for it at some point. Um, and then crabs will eat these and lots of fish. So if you like anchovy or smelt, uh, those eat these, and uh, those then become, those smelt or tiny fish and crabs and clams become food for sea otters, for leopard sharks, and um, for sand dab and halibut. So if you like seeing sea otters, or if you like catching and eating halibut like me, uh, we rely on these tiny creatures and their populations. 
because if they disappear, those other things that eat them will be affected and will start having to compete more. Um, and we won't be able to see them or catch them as much. So definitely the next time you're out enjoying the charismatic megafauna, like seals and sea otters, remember these tiny creatures that are really important too. Well, thank you. It looks like we've covered all of the questions. Ariel, is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up? No, the only other thing I would say is if you want to find out more about these creatures, definitely check out um, our Facebook page, Elkhorn Slough Reserve. If you type that in in the search bar in Facebook, you'll get all sorts of videos on these creatures, including other recorded microscope labs um, and lots of live events that we do um, related to these, just like we're doing today. So if you want to learn more, please reach out to us anytime. Great. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Your feedback is valuable to us. So there's a post-session survey with only two questions. Please rate the session by clicking on the button rate session in Whova below uh, this video or posting your thoughts on the community board under general feedback. Please enjoy more sessions on the agenda and our pre-recorded videos. Then go outside and enjoy your local parks and open spaces. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Ariel. Awesome, thank you. And come out, out to us. We're open Wednesday through Sunday, nine to five for trail access. Perfect. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>